hope that Rio will create an, an, a new kind of openness to discuss goals, pathways to goals in a more open way than has been the situation so far. Uh, I think most of the of the key international processes uh, on global issues are intergovernmental processes where stakeholders, be they business or civil society or whatever, uh, only have a role as, as observers, they're not full partners at the table. Uh, I think it is, is very difficult to restructure an intergovernmental process to become a, a non-governmental process, but I think when you're embarking some, on something new, as we will be in Rio, that could be an opportunity to, uh, to formulate processes uh, differently. And I think we've, we've seen the beginning of that. For example, the, the, the UN Secretary General over the past couple of years has organized uh, at least two high-level panels that I'm aware of. Uh, one on climate and one more broadly on sustainable development. And, and those are beginning to show signs of a broader membership, a broader participation, a broader engagement. How would you think that will change the course of affair in, in business and in what governments do? Um, well, I, I, I think in a way where um, we're, we're past the phase where you can simply sit back and wait for governments to, to formulate a policy framework which business then uh, operates within and, and according to. I think we're much more in a phase where um, policy direction, uh, policy content needs to be, needs to be shaped in a, in a partnership. I think we're moving much more towards a, a phase of, of public-private partnerships. And, and my sense is that um, that that will result in a great deal of enthusiasm from, from the business community. I, I think, the, in, in a way, you could also say that the business community has grown up uh, over the past 10 or 15 years. I think you could argue that, that 10 or 15 years ago, um, business did not want to show its cards. It sat back and waited for government to formulate policy and then started to kick the policy. Um, what I think is interesting on the road to Rio is that now major corporations on their own are beginning to offer commitments, partnerships and ideas. How does it change the role of government? Because businesses do need governments, for instance, to provide the sort of the certainty that investments is worthwhile. Yeah, they do. It's, it's not I, absolutely not a question that you can do um, without, uh, without government, but, but, but I would define um, business action in terms of, of, of three layers of, of, of possibility. Uh, the first layer is that I think there is still an awful lot that businesses can do to reduce cost and enhance the efficiency uh, of their operations, whether it's on, on energy, on waste, on water, or the management of their supply chain, uh, or whatever. There's an awful lot that business can still do that reduces cost and enhances efficiency. The, the, the second layer is for me the things that businesses can do um, to put new products and services into the market to enhance their standing and, uh, and reputation. And in that second layer there are significant things which they can do uh, together. For example, uh, consumer goods organizations that are now saying as of 2015 we will only sustainably source soy or palm oil or beef. That's a way of by working together as a business community in the marketplace that you can stretch the boundaries of, uh, of the possible. The third level is the level at which you really need uh, you really need a, a perspective from policymakers. You really need a perspective uh, from government, and that that is above all, uh, I think, a a a sense of long term direction. I mean, if I talk to CEOs around the world now and ask them what do you need most, they don't say subsidies or money or tax breaks. What they say is is a long term sense of, of perspective of, of of clarity, and that I think is where governments are critical. Now, that is what you often hear as the vision thing, we need a, a vision, but is that robust enough for the business community? No, if you don't get beyond vision, it's not, it's not robust enough. You, you, you need to move beyond that and, uh, and, and come to implementation. But I do think that the vision, the sense of direction, is an important first step. Mm -hmm. And I think that shaping the road to achieving that vision is, is something that needs to happen more in partnership. So what are we looking towards then? Is that a sort of a legal, on a national level, a climate law like in the UK? Or how, how do you cre create a vision and in, in, in make it implementable? 
I think a climate law helps mm-hmm. at the end of the day. Uh, I think for, for the business community to have legal clarity uh, is, is important. Uh, what I think is nice about the UK climate law um, is that it's a law with long-term goals. Um, and, and what I mean by nice is the fact that um, you see business suffering enormously from the fact that every time there's an election, there's a, a, a change of policy directions. And things like the UK law give you much more of that, of that long-term clarity and predictability. Can that be handled on the national level? Or you think we, in the end, still have to go to sort of international treaty-type uh, solutions? I think you still have to go to treaties. Um, the, the question is, what do you want to use the treaties for? Um, my sense is that international processes, above all, were used up to now and in the past mainly to formulate goals and not so much to focus on implementation. I think in the future the focus needs to be more on, on, on implementation, on, on creating um, frameworks for implementation. For example, if I look at the, at the climate change negotiations, there the, the emphasis is still on, on setting targets, but the emphasis is much more strongly on monitoring, reporting, uh, verification, the role of market-based mechanisms. So in other words, the, the operational architecture. So that's the new phase where we're, we're moving towards. I think that's a, a, a new phase that we're, we're moving towards, and that means, I mean, Rio consists of two parts, substance and, 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 and structure. Um, I think it will also be important to change the way in which the United Nations system functions and delivers in, in support of, of achievement of goals. Yeah. Now, in the lead up to Rio, there's, of course, a lot of hope initially that greening of the economy would be a new sort of thing that would unite. In the meantime, we've seen in the lead up that uh, the G77 have more or less turned against that idea of a greening of the economy because they were afraid that they would be losing out on market opportunities, the new trade barriers and, and, and the like. Some, however, argue that greening of the economy might be an opportunity for the developing world to sort of kickstart their development by you know, sort of not making the mistakes the West has made in the 20th century. But what's your opinion uh, about uh, possibilities of uh, a greening of the economy that would be acceptable to all? Um, my sense is that a lot of people talk about green growth, but that not so many people understand what it really means. So it's a, it's a wonderful concept, but, but what does it mean uh, in, in the context of your, your country, your city, your province, or, uh, or your company? Can, can you really make it real at, uh, at that level? And I think it is this um, lack of understanding what it can actually, lack of understanding of what it can actually mean, that is causing the resistance to the concept. So I think we, and this once again goes to the point of implementation. I, I think we we really need to go now to the level of, of countries and companies and cities, and begin to give that green growth story shape in, in real terms rather than talking about it in, in the abstract. And that means that the green growth story for Sao Paulo is going to be different than the green growth story for Lagos and the story for Mali is going to be different than the story for Korea. So basically you say the uh, obstacles now in the lead up to Rio are to be overcome by opening up what greening of the economy might mean in different parts of the world. By, by deepening the understanding of, of what the greening of an economy can mean in specific circumstances, by designing policy frameworks and perspectives and laws in such a way that they draw a greening of the economy uh, into the market, and by uh, creating tools and incentives that promote a, a, a greening of the economy. I think, I, th- I think at the moment internationally we're, we're much too strongly focused on sticks or things that are perceived to be sticks and we're not focused enough on things that are carrots or taste like carrots. Which carrots do you like best? Um, Well, for example, I think in in, in the climate domain, um, um, market-based mechanisms are a fantastic uh, Mm -hmm. carrot because then you, 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 you turn CO2 into a commodity uh, whereby you can make money by reducing emissions. I think that that's a, uh, a very attractive way. I think that, with the, that we need to do more things um, to, to give sustainable goods and services a fair chance in, uh, in, in, 
the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, KPMG just launched a report uh, called uh, Expect the Unexpected. Um, thereby, you show very much that KPMG wants to play its role in this sphere. Can you tell me something about the, the role that KPMG is going to play uh, yeah, over the next couple of years? Um, well, our, our sense is that um, that there is a, a, a very urgent need to redefine the way in which business value is determined and to redefine the way in which business strategies are, uh, are created. Uh, I think that there is at the moment a, a, a much too narrow focus on shareholder value in purely financial terms and I think there is a much too strong focus on defining value in the context of the next quarter uh, or the next half year uh, in, in, instead of looking further ahead. And if you look at um, global megatrends on energy prices, energy security, material scarcity, water scarcity, food scarcity, uh, population growth, and how those global trends are, are going to impact the business environment, it basically means that, that businesses need to develop uh, strategies that are, are both thinking further ahead, but also defining value more comprehensively. But that's it. Huge agenda. It it is a it, it is a huge agenda. Um, but but what for example we did in the context of, of um, that report, expect the unexpected, is say well if these are the major global megatrends, uh, you know, on energy etc. That, that I just mentioned, what is the relevance of those global megatrends to individual sectors of the economy? So to airlines, to automobiles, to cement etc. Um, so that companies understand much better how they're likely to be uh, impacted and, and what they need to respond to. So that, that those are ways of breaking down an indeed very, very large issue into something more manageable. Okay. Now, so some economists and political economists, institutional economists, argue that this might be sort of a new wave of contract shift. So the idea that we have to go through a phase of creative destruction of the old industrial equipment and go to sustainability technologies. Do you think that's far-fetched? Um, yes, I, I, I think it is. Um, because from, from a political point of view, um, the, the, the major power and influence is with the old economy and not with the new economy. So if in the process of trying to get to the new economy you destroy the old economy or don't help the old economy to make the transition to the new economy, you're going to create such massive political uh, resistance that you'll fail. So the alternative is? So the alternative, I, I, I think, is that, um, that you need to see this very much in the context of a, of a transition mm -hmm. um, whereby you, um, you, you, also, well, whereby you, uh, you help or allow the old economy to make that transition right. to a new economy. And a, a consequence of that might be that things go too slowly. A consequence of that could very well be that you do see severe impacts of climate change, that, that you do see material scarcity uh, occurring. But I think politically, uh, a disruptive model is, is, is very difficult to, uh, to, to realize. Yeah. Um, I also think that you know, through, through policy you can, you can force change. I've, I've always argued that, that climate change is the easiest problem in the world to solve because all you need to do is to, is to, to push the price of fossil fuels up to reflect their environmental cost and push the price of renewables down through research and development and when those two lines cross, climate problem solved. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense I think you know, policy can help to change, can change, can help to change the marketplace. Uh, I suppose that the, the, the conservative argument could also be the introduction of ICT. Yeah? So it doesn't need to be that you destroy an industry. You, you change the, the logic of the industry by adding a new technology. Yeah? So the car industry changed dramatically. Um, and nevertheless, it was a different sort of industry. Well, I mean, so you, you, you know the joke that the, that the Stone Age didn't end because the stones were finished, but the Stone Age ended because we found something new. Um, 
that's fine. But the but the problem is that the, the, the political and economic power at this moment is in the hands of the stone arrowhead uh, makers, and they they need to understand that they have a, a place in the context of, of this of this transition. Secondly. Um, there, you need to stimulate, um, probably many of your economists would disagree with that as well, but I, th I think you need to uh, stimulate a change in demand in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people that, that own supermarkets and they're trying to put a sustainable fish next to a not so sustainable fish and the customers only buy the not so sustainable fish because it's a little bit cheaper than, than the sustainable fish. And that basically means to me that you need to um, through policy, create an environment whereby the sustainable fish is actually cheaper than the unsustainable fish. Mm -hmm. um, this leads me to a final question. This is all basically economic reasoning, and I th there is an open question, I suppose, which is the real sort of dynamic of change. Is that an economic, ecological, or is the value change? And um, you see that reoccurring. The, like the Stone Age metaphor, there's another metaphor that's reoccurring, is, is the environment something like slavery? Is that something that you want to sort of abolish because you think it's immoral? Uh, Jim Henson, who was always good at uh, metaphors, recently invoked that one as well. He says, well, basically, we are, the only way to solve this is to see that this is no longer the way we want to do it. What do you think there? Because these two logics interfere, right? You can either protect the rainforest because it's a global public good, or you can try and put a value on it with a TEEP system. Do you have an opinion about that? I remember a, a conversation a number of years ago with, um, with Femke Halsema, who used to lead the Green Party uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and she said to me, you know, people are just like chameleons. Uh, they walk into a voting group booth green and they come out brown uh, on, uh, on, on the other side. Um, I, I, I think that, 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 that many people, I mean, to, to, to switch to another metaphor, it, it's a bit like cooking the frog. Um, I, I think a lot of people are the, the, the frog in cold water that is very slowly uh, being heated and they, they don't perceive a sense of urgency. Um, secondly, a great deal of the, the urgency and the crisis is, is far away, certainly from the people that hold the economic and the political power at, uh, at, at this moment in time. So I, I do not have the sense that we are on the brink of a moral revolution which is going to demand uh, protection of the environment in significant ways. So who are the agents of change then? Um, well, the, 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 the agents of change, to my mind, can very significantly be business leaders, and I am seeing a growing number of business leaders uh, stand up and, and begin, to, uh, begin to make a difference, begin to, to redefine uh, the agenda. Um, I, I also think that there is an urgent need for politicians to do what they were elected to do, which is to lead, which they're by and large not doing at this moment in time because of you know, short-term preoccupations that relate to the economic crisis, the financial crisis, uh, et, uh, etc. But I think we need, we need to see stronger leadership from, from, from politicians. I don't think we're going to see that leadership uh, in the context of global processes like, like the climate change negotiations. Um, but I, I do think that, that, that small groups of leaders that are willing to define an agenda and take others with them can play a very significant role.